Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Crystal Kwok. In our show last time, we gave you part one of our report of the August meeting of the Harvard Club and the talk by John Fink. This time, we'll give you the second part of John Fink's remarks. To recapitulate, John Fink has been involved in media in Hawaii for more than four decades. He began his media career in public relations for a pro soccer team, Team Hawaii, then in the North American Soccer League, and then radio at KIKI, KMAI, then KGMB-TV, and KHNL-TV, which became a partner with K5 in the 1990s. John is a graduate of Wesleyan University, where he took a bachelor's in East Asian history. As you saw from our last show, John is a close observer of the local and national television and media scene. It's changing as we go forward on a dynamic basis because of the way that certainly the younger generation is taking their time and viewing TV. The amount of people who now watch TV with a secondary device by their side is like 60 or 70 percent. We all know that this has basically become an appendage. I will tell you from a psychosociological standpoint, this is causing havoc in terms of people being able to communicate. And we also know what it can do in terms of cyberbullying and all these other horrible things. And there are some great things it can do too. But the people who are using it are not, many of them are not thinking of it that way. This is another issue that's gonna be a major, major consideration in years to come. I remember the quaint old days when you used to go to a movie, and I know this is gonna be hard to believe, but the movie ended and you actually turned to the person next to you and you went, what'd you think? Now what's the first thing everybody does in a movie when it ends? They pull out their phone because God knows it, the president might be trying to reach you. I mean, it's gotta be, <laughs> I, I don't understand what happened that we suddenly decided we were so valuable that missing two hours of life on a Saturday night, and the answer is nothing happened. That's the answer, nothing happened. Do you know that most people, I think it's like 90%, respond to a text within three minutes of receiving it? There are married couples who don't respond to each other within a week of receiving a message. <laughs> so it's, it's a different world out there, and I think it's something to keep in mind. So you have your, uh, your broadcast stations, which I mentioned. So they're independent stations like K5, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, PBS. In m many markets, you have a Hispanic station or two. And then you have your cable stations which I've mentioned, which include ESPN and Fox News and CNN and Headline News and the History Channel and all those other channels up in the hinterland of your dials. And you have what are known as the MSOs, the Multiple Service Operators, which is Spectrum, Hawaiian Telecom, DISH, and DirecTV. Those are our four major providers here of programming. If you, if you subscribe to one of those, they are providing the signals for you from all of those cable channels and the local broadcasters. And that's how the world is set up now. But the world is changing. We make our money, it used to be we made our money one way, advertising. So you can squawk and moan all you want, but no advertising, no TV. That's the way it used to be. If we can't pay for the programs, we can't put them on. So thank you for all those of you who advertise. We now get what's known as retransmission consent, that we allow the cable company, satellite company, or phone company to retransmit our signal in exchange they pay us on a monthly basis. And that has helped the revenue stream because the advertising has started to shift with the whole digital world and people reassessing how they spend their money between regular digital advertising, social media, and everything else like that. So it has uh, provided a, a windfall in terms of allowing TV stations to keep up their revenue models as things have gotten a little bit tougher. Um, our competition right now includes certainly the internet and internet aggregators. Uh, everybody knows about YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Google and Twitter. And now there is this thing called over the top, which is OTT is the acronym you'll see for it. What it means is you get something directly sent to your computer. It does not go through your TV anymore. So you can get HBO on your mobile device or on your iPad or on your desktop. You can get um, other cable channels and some broadcast through your computer. Now, if you're savvy enough to have a 12 year old at home who can figure it out for you, you can actually have them set it up and it can go through your big 60 inch TV. So, I mean, there's that opportunity also. Um, right now, there are 193 million OTT users in the US. Some of you never heard the term till I just mentioned it. Over half of America is now using OTT. Adults with a paid TV subscription, which is, you know, Oceanic, well, Spectrum, that's declined from 78% 
it will decline from 78% to 69 over the next few years. That's the latest prognostication. It used to be 90%. So it's gone from 90% 10 years ago to 78% to 69%. There's an entire generation of people being brought up who, as I said, will never have a newspaper subscription, will never own a landline telephone, and will not subscribe to a service for their television. They will figure out another ways to get it. Um, our other competition on top of that and 300 cable channels, of course, is the newspaper, the radio, movie theaters, magazine, leisure activities. So to have rules in place now that were in place in 1964, it just doesn't make a lot of sense in a lot of instances. In other instances, right on. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in some of the FCC policies and things, but they need to be revamped. And the way the FCC works is whoever the president is gets three votes on the FCC and the other party gets two votes. So every time you have shifts in Washington, which tend to happen every four to eight years, you get a whole new group of FCC chairpersons in who try to make changes and have to fight with Congress or uh, public interest groups or self-serving lobbyists and things like that. And as things move forward to get changed, sometimes if it takes long enough, a new administration comes in. So it'll be fascinating to see what can happen because now you have an administration that is obviously uh, on, on its surface um, much more business friendly in appearance and they do have three Republican FCC chair people and two Democrat ones so any vote that is controversial you would think would always go three to two which most people believe will favor the business interests on a going forward basis so we'll see we will see what this means of course is that the consumer has more choices than ever it's the best time ever to be I mean when I, I I'm guilty of it too I'll go home and I'll look around and I'll say there's nothing on TV tonight, which is a really stupid comment to make because there's only 300 things on TV tonight. It used to be you didn't think like that and you picked one of the five options you had. And if you were an hour late, you missed it totally. Couldn't get it back until it came back in reruns. So, I mean, think about that. There's nothing you can miss anymore. What it means from our standpoint is we need to put on compelling enough programming to keep you coming back. We need to get people to watch us because how many people watch us is part of the reason why people advertise with us and it becomes that whole cycle of what we need to have happen. So from our standpoint, that's why we've chosen to go with a very local basis. We do shows like What's Cooking Hawaii and Chef Rock and we have high sessions and we have Hot Hawaiian Nights and Voice of the Sea, which is a UH educational message about environment and we have Hokkaido TV where local people go to Japan and we have another Japanese show coming up because we feel these are things that people are interested in and it differentiates us. I can always buy another sitcom. I can always buy another hour of old network TV, but there are 42 other stations that do that. So you wouldn't necessarily need me. And of course, we have a, what I consider to be a very compelling news product in our Hawaii News Now product. Now, up until a couple of years ago, we were the only guys at 8 a.m., the only guys at 6.30 p.m. and the only guys at 9 p.m. Well, then KITV decided to take their 6 o'clock and go all the way to 7, so now we have competition from 6.30 to 7. And then two years ago, KHON decided to do a 9 o'clock news, and they brought in Howard Dushevsky, who was my old news anchor, and they now have a 9 o'clock news. And one month from now, KHON, which currently has a show called Living 808 at 8 o'clock, is going to move that thing to 4 o'clock, and that's a pure sales show. And at 8 o'clock, they're going to continue their morning news for one more hour. So we will now have competition at 8 o'clock in the morning. So we don't have our own niche. We just have to do it better than anybody else is what it comes down to. And I'm not really worried. I think our Sunrise product in the morning is a pretty compelling and interesting product. So we'll continue to do that for the time being. Um, so you have hundreds of choices on TV and cable. You have millions of choices. I had the number here. It was staggering to me. I want to say there are 650, 644 million websites right now. 644 million websites. I've not been to every one, but, <laughs> but I can tell you, if you don't think that there's a niche audience somewhere for, for all of these, you're, you're mistaken. And, and in and of themselves, we used to say about cable, the ratings were horrible on cable but 100 cable channels doing a 0.1 rating, one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population, multiply that by 100, that's 10 rating points. That's a lot of people to be losing. So in and of itself, none of those cable channels were a threat, but as a whole, I think the term they use is being nibbled to death by goldfish or something like that. There's some term like that that they use. That has been the problem. Um, 
the market is going <coughs> to shake everything out over the next five to ten years. Um, there, listen to these companies that have valuations of well over a billion dollars, all of which are losing huge boatloads of money. Snapchat, how about Twitter? It's lost over $2 billion the last couple of years. Zynga, Instagram, Amazon.com, Pandora, Weibo, which is China's Twitter, Zillow, Sprint, Square, and Sony. Big old Sony has lost money six of the last seven years. Something has to give. Somebody at some point is going to have to make a payment and investors are going to have to start going, whoa, time out. So all you hear about Twitter, and we know it's, God knows it's in the news far too often these days, but something's got to give with Twitter. And the theory is that Twitter's valuation keeps going down because it's not breaking through and it hasn't figured out a model to start making a lot of money. As the stock value goes down, somebody will probably swoop in and buy it. That's what tends to happen if they see a, a business model there. And maybe it's through economies of scale or something like that. So at the end of the day, with whatever it is you're interested in or want to watch or when you want to watch it, everyone gets what they want, when they want, where they want it, how they want it. I mean, you can really do that now. That is an unbelievable opportunity. But at the end of the day, content is king. It doesn't matter what you put on there. If there's not an audience for it, at some point, in and of itself, it's got to fail. I, I, I don't know how else to explain that other than to say that the only thing that is as important as content at some point is probably exclusivity and how you deliver the message. I mean, one of the reasons you see exorbitant rates being paid for live events is because most of those live events are really not recordable. And I don't mean you can't record them. I mean, who wants to watch the Super Bowl two days later unless you're a Patriots fan and, you know, you want to see the game again. But, but people don't watch the Academy Awards two days later once they know who won the best picture. So stations and entities are willing to pay a premium. I'll give you a good example. Last year, Twitter paid $5 million for the rights to stream NFL football on Thursday night. They have those, those NFL Thursday games of the week, which is al already a, a potentially a problem because NFL ratings have come down and some people are suggesting that they're, it's too, they're too many. It used to be it was just Sunday, then it became Monday night, then it became Sunday night, now we have Thursday night. Uh, so they're saying that maybe it's been spread too far, so it's something the NFL has to take a look at. So they paid $5 million for Thursday games. I think there were eight Thursday games, so they really paid a huge premium for, and they also had to pay production costs. That's just the rights fees, okay? $5 million by Twitter last year. This fall, the NFL Thursday night games, same number of games, will be available on Amazon Prime, and it'll be paid, they'll pay $50 million, 5-0. They're paying 10 times what Twitter paid. Now, at that number, they cannot make money. But what they want everyone to do is sign up for Amazon Prime, which costs you $100 a year. And if you do the math and say if, if a million people sign up, there's $100 million that will pay for the $50 million plus their production cost. So my guess is that's the model. But the only way you can get it is to be an Amazon Prime member. So if you shop on Amazon, you're not getting football. If you're an Amazon Prime member and you pay $100 a year, you're going to get Thursday night football. But this is the world we live in now where the rich will get richer, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, they will continue to grow and take over other companies and will change the way we all watch and see and hear things. Um, good or bad, that is what's going to happen. My feeling on local broadcast is that we will survive as long as we continue to produce a quality local product. And of course, quality is in the eye of the beholder. I put on a lot of local shows I'm sure people think suck. Some of them I don't care for that much, but I'm not the audience, so as long as there's an audience out there. You know, I was in radio, and I did a lot of, with music, and boy, there were cuts I put on there that I said, are you kidding me? But number one is number one, so if it's a hit, it's a hit. Um, as long as we continue to provide relevant and interesting education, entertainment, information to our local audience, which is really all we care about and serve, I think local broadcasts will have a future. As long as we can make sure that you know if there's a hurricane coming, how much time you have to prepare. We provide a service to people. As long as we can tell you about Zika and rat lungworm and hepatitis B and you can go out and do something about it, we serve a purpose that no national provider can give you. And so I'm not going to suggest we look forward to those types of things, but as a broadcaster, that's my feeling is if we can give that to a community, 
that, that's a really nice service. I used to do play-by-play -play for Wahine Volleyball when Wahine Volleyball was on K5 for 28 years. And um, I loved doing it. The team has always been great. Dave Shoji is a good friend of mine, and the team's always been great. But I got to tell you how many times I'd go and see somebody who would recognize me from TV, and they would say, thank you for putting the game on. And I would realize whatever else was going on in their life, however difficult things would be, or job was bad, or personal life or health was bad, for two hours on a Friday night, I could provide a safe haven for them to watch our wahine play volleyball. And, and selfishly, I felt good about being able to do that and let them know that, oh yeah, the wahine are on, and God, they're good, aren't they? I, I kind of like what we can do with TV. I also know the bad things that TV can do. And this is where I get into this new world we have where everything is 24-7. Um, there is not enough news and there aren't enough people that we can pay and have a business model to provide the news on a 24-7 basis. So whether it's Fox News or Headline News or CNN News, they can't exist for 24 hours, but they do. So either they repeat stuff or they bring in one more stupid expert al analysis on an issue that's not even necessarily an issue, but understand they've got to provide something compelling, and I use that in quotes or else you're gonna change the channel. How hard is it to change the channel, right? If you go to numerous news websites, the words you will see nowadays is theoretically, speculation, word has it that. You gotta be careful with it. You gotta be careful with it, and we can get into the fake news thing in a minute, but um, if it's not vetted, and the one thing I would tell you in a local newsroom is no story gets on unless people have done their homework. There's no wild guy sitting in his mother's basement with his own little website making up news every day that suddenly people follow because they go, yeah, I like this guy. Well, he's, he's a liar. I, I don't, you can say what you want about it, but this person has, nobody is vetting him. Nobody is checking on the sources. Nobody is making sure that what you're getting is true. You now as a consumer have to have a filter. And one can argue as much as you want that 30, 40, 50 years ago when we watched Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather or any of the vaunted news people, there was somebody who said, put the story on and put it on fairly. Now again, I'm using subjective terms here. Well, what's fairly? If you didn't like the story, you wouldn't think it was fair. But if it was balanced, if it tried to get both sides of the story, if it provided the information and let you make up your own decision on it as a thinking human being, as a voter, I think it did its job. That is much easier to do these days on the local level than it is on the national level. And I think we've seen what's happened to the news and, and what it's done. And now we have a president who would like to tell you that the media is the enemy. And uh, I, I just, I can't fathom that because that's the same media that made him what he is today that he's now calling the enemy because pretty sure if he didn't have the notoriety he got over all these years, he might not be in the position he's in. And um, we'll, we'll see how that plays out over time. Now, there's a difference between getting a story wrong and fake news. Fake news to me is an oxymoron. It's jumbo shrimp, okay? There's no such thing as fake news. If it's fake news, it's a lie, and that's not news. So I want to get the misnomer out that fake news, the people doing fake news know what they're doing. They are doing it purposely. They're doing it to hook people in. They're doing it to express a certain point of view, but no one's vetting it, and they don't care. They don't care. And if you ask them, they'll tell you that, okay? That is not the same as this, where a newspaper puts out the headline that Dewey defeats Truman. That's not fake news. That's bad reporting. That's an assumption. That's a mistake. But it wasn't done with malintent. It was they tried to jump the gun. And under the old adage of it's important to be first, they decided to be first instead of be right. And obviously, it's more important to be right, accurate, fair, correct. And that's what we should all strive to do. But don't confuse this type of reporting with fake news. Fake news is malicious, it's cancerous, and it's harmful. And it's putting a bad name on the people who are trying to put real news out there on a regular basis and there's nothing we can do to control it. The internet providers, Facebook, Google, Mozilla, YouTube, and others, aggregators of content, are now committed to putting messages by stories that seem questionable. They're, going, they're putting little, you probably have seen it if you check this, I'd say put, this has not been verified, or, but, but now we get into the whole, well, how do you, what do you wanna do about censorship here? You know, we can get into this whole another discussion about what happened in Virginia this past weekend but, you know, the people who don't like the guys who went out to uh, protest in the first place, you bring more attention to these people by what happened there than if 100 people had just 
done their thing. And I'm not going to suggest they're right, but my point is you, you build something into something larger than life by focusing on it. And don't think every news organization in the country doesn't love the ability to now cover this thing. You've now get, remember, they're 24-7. They've got to have stuff to talk about. So we have the right to free speech in this country. Hateful though it may be, we have the right to free speech. I've watched, and I don't, and nobody, a couple of people here might have been Cal graduates, but I remember when I was a kid, Cal Berkeley was the bastion of free speech and certainly far left leaning speech in America. Nowadays, Cal is taking every other speaker that somebody comes up with and they're telling them, no, you can't come here because you have views that are abhorrent to this group or this group, and I understand that. But this country is based on free speech. That's how we all got here in the first place. It's the First Amendment, not the Twelfth, it's the First Amendment. So where do you want to draw the line on cutting off speech, hateful though it may be, where do you want to get to that point? And I think we're going to see this tested over and over again as time goes on. And, um, you know, for people who talk about fake news, I, was, I looked it up, and there was discussion about, you guys might not remember this, but in 1200 BC, um, Ramses the Great spread lies about his war victories, Octavian, one of my favorites, ran a misinformation campaign about Mark Antony. And the list goes on and on through yellow to through medieval times and the, the print press, the so-called yellow journalism, everybody who's old enough or is an historical buff remembers McCarthyism, which was complete lies and things of that nature. The Dewey wins, Orson Welles did War of the Worlds. Anybody who's old enough to remember radio, everybody thought we were being invaded by Martians. So I mean, fake news, Let's be careful and not think this is a, a, a current or new trend. This stuff has always been out there, but it wasn't as prevalent, it wasn't as easy to get, and we weren't being pulled apart by it like we are now. I remember sitting with Senator Inouye, I don't know how long he's been gone for now, but let's say this was like eight or nine years ago, and we're sitting next to each other, and I don't get that opportunity, obviously, very much, so I wanted to talk to him about things. I said, and this was during, uh, early on in the Obama administration, so there were horrible things being said on, things were being pulled apart, nothing was getting accomplished, and I said to him, what, what's it like in Washington, D.C.? And he sighed and he said, his great deep voice said, well, John, he said, I have been in Washington, D.C. now for 45, 50 years. He said, I have never seen such vitriolic language, and he said, and part of it now is that because of the anonymity and people hiding behind phony email addresses and things, people can take horrible cheap shots and say anything they want, and there's no accountability for it. In a world where our leaders work so hard for public opinion and where they often create public confusion, getting honest media is more important than ever before. Thanks to John Fink and the Harvard Club. For more about K5, see k5thehometeam.com. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them. But ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week to stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands. ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com radio. 
and repost all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. Think Tech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to shows at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and the events that affect our lives together in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. That wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Crystal does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechway.com. Be a guest or a host or a producer or an intern and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Crystal Kwok. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.